Hello, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so welcome very much to the, uh, welcome to the, uh, thank you for coming to the uh, seminar, the third seminar of Dialogue on Philosophy and Technology. Uh, my name is Yu Koi. Uh, I'm the organizer of this series of uh, seminars with my colleagues, uh, Ashley Wong and uh, uh, Edwin Lowe. Um, so this is the third seminar of our series. Uh, this series is initiated by the uh, by the Cosmotechnics Critical AI Research Project, supported by the City University of Hong Kong and in collaboration with the Research Network for Philosophy and Technology. Um, so in the previous seminars, we have a workshop with, uh, we have a seminar with Catherine Malabu. And uh, two weeks ago, we also have a seminar with uh, Kami Cham and other participants. So um, today, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jean-Luc Barthélemy, who is a friend, a uh, colleague, a friend, and a philosopher and associate with, associated researcher at Paris Nanterre. Um, Jean-Luc is um, a, a well-known scholar of the work of uh, Gilbert Simondon. And um, he has edited the Cahier Simondon from 2009 to 2015 and directed the Centre International des Etudes Simondoniennes from 2014 to 2019, uh, of which I'm, I was also a member and I also contributed to the Cahier Simondon. Uh, um, as well. Um, Jean Ruth is author of many books um, on Simondon, including Simondon ou l'encyclopédisme génétique, published in 2008, and Life and Technology, an inquiry into, the, into and beyond Simondon, uh, published by Maison Press 2015. Uh, uh, of which I'm a series editor with uh, Eric Herr. And um, Jean Rue has recently published uh, two books. One is, um, where well, I could show it properly, La Société de l'Invention, uh, The Society of Invention, and more recently, another book called uh, Ego Up There, The Alter Ego Dialogue for the Future, of the earth. And as you see that he is very much concerned with the question of ecology. Um, he, his next books, the forthcoming books, uh, including uh, Manifest pour l'Ecology Humaine, the manifest, Manifesto for Human Ecology going to come out in 2022. Uh, ecology and technology we define the progress up to Simondon 2022. Uh, these are all coming next year. And Jean Ruud is also a member of the advisory committee to the Research Network for Philosophy and Technology that I initiated in 2014. So um, it's a great, great pleasure for me to uh, welcome Jean Ruud. Uh, and later on to give, uh, to have a dialogue with him. So the protocol of our seminars will be, is uh, always the, the, the um, invitee will give a talk and then uh, there will be a dialogue uh, between us and then we're open to questions from the public. So, um, so thank you, Jean Ruch. I think I will give the time to you. And Jean Ruch is going to give a talk uh, with the title uh, Towards Philosophical Relativity. So, if uh, Jean Ruch, if you are around, if you are still there, can you turn on the camera? <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Yuk. It's a great pleasure to to be here and to expose 
uh, to introduce you to uh, my project of uh, philosophical relativity. It's a great pleasure to, to, uh, to see you now uh, after a long period without seeing you. And um, if you allow me, uh, I, I would like to, to uh, introduce my talk with a remark, a remark on uh, the problem of translation of um, what, what is a new, a new uh, philosophy. Uh, first of all, I must say that there is a difficulty to, in the translation of my thought and this difficulty concerns the word significations, or in, in French, in French, signification. Uh, it is a word I use in French, signification. And in order to construct a philosophy uh, that is not a knowledge proper, I have replaced the word rep representation with the word signification, which also refers in French to the word sign, signe, signe in French, sign in English. And I have translated this notion of signification with the English word meaning, but maybe you could understand signification. There is here a real uncertainty for me. In the same way, the word sens in French refers to the to the, uh, the sense making and not only to the meaning. That's why I have translated sense by sense making. But here we must be conscious that a new philosophical thought can cause new problems of translation. And it's, it's a real difficulty for me. Well, now I come to my general introduction of my talk. I have called Simondon's properly philosophical doctrine, genetic encyclopedism, as it is distinguished from his lectures and as it unifies his two doctoral thesis, individuation in the light of the notions of form and information and the mode of existence of technical objects. The problem of the unity of those two tests was one of the many problems I had encountered early on in my effort to exegete his work. However, this exe exegetical work, also animated by the, con the, convic the conviction that I could reveal all the strengths and actuality of this thought, was in reality, in reality always directed towards an after Simondon. Even before my doctoral thesis, such work was guided by the project of a future encompassing refoundation of his ontology, relativized as a second problematics and no longer a first philosophy, as Simondon called it. Such an encompassing refoundation happens within a system whose first problematics is a philosophical semantics and which bears the name of philosophical relativity. Two other names of this new philosophical system are system of the individuation of sense-making and human ecology. Those two names emphasize both its new first problematics which is that of sense-making and its political purpose, which is ecological. And as, as the name philosophical relativity indicates in its own way, the particularity of such a system will be not to be a system of knowledge. Its globality being in reality, the most immediate consequence of the diffraction of the manip manipulated meanings. I use the word manipulate in the sense of use. Manipulated meanings are used meanings. The diffraction of the manipulated meanings is the remedy to their traditional objectivation by the attitude of knowledge, 
as well as to the relativism itself, insofar as it is still an, a matter of this objectivation of the, of the meanings by the philosophizing individual. The internal, the internal criticism uh, of uh, Simondon's genetic encyclopedism will lead us to the idea of this system that is both global and radically anti-dogmatic. I will then conclude with some consequence of the ontology does uh, does secondary 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 way oui, yes secondary yes some con consequence of the, the ontology does secondary then uh, those consequences leading us back to the question of technique but also to that of desire in a critical dialogue with Simondon but also with Stigler. In the last chapter of Penser la connaissance et la technique après Simondon, and again in chapter six of La Société de l'Invention, I raised two problems with Simondon's genetic ontology, which do not seem to me to be reduced to simple paradoxes, which could be resolved as such. First problem, Simondon's genetic ontology or ontogenesis is said to be first philosophy. And at the, at the same time, it is presented by him, by Simonon, as based on physical schemes of thought. There is an aporia here. If it is true that a first philosophy is defined as a problematics that can, that can only be based on itself. This is, in fact, the characteristic of what has been called first philosophy since Aristotle metaphysics. If metaphysics came after physics, it also came beyond the latter. And this did, this did not mean from physics, but rather in an autonomy that alone allows for the treatment of fundamental questions that physics does not address. Physics could not provide a first philosophy with schemes of thought or conceptual paradigm. Even if it could provide, as it does for this new type of first philosophy, that is the theory of knowledge in the critique of pure reason, analogical, methodological, and theological par paradigms. In Kant's case, in Kant's case, those were respectively the Copernican revolution, the Galilean inclined plane, and the Newtonian physics to be philosophically founded. The first philosophy, therefore, which would be based on physical schemes of thought or conceptual paradigm derived, derived from physics, would immediately find itself stripped of its status. Now, in the system of philosophical relativity, whose program and structure I gave in 2018, the first philosophy is philosophical semantics as simple self-knowledge in its own non-originality and genetic ontology as a second translation is no more than a unifying synthesis of scientific knowledge. Indeed, science, in their absence of unity, remain, however, methodolo methodologically autonomous and gnoseologically sovereign. Second problem, Simondon, immediately after claiming for genetic ontology the status of first philosophy, adds, I quote, unfortunately, it is impossible for the human subject to witness its own genesis for the subject must exist in order to think. There is an immediate difficulty here because Simondon's, Simondon's link between the idea of first philosophy and the idea of attending one's own genesis means that while condemning as vain the undertaking of the Husserlian phenomenologist 
who want to attend their own genesis. Simondon concedes to them, to them that attending one's own genesis would indeed be the self-knowledge in which a true first philosophy consists. Simondon also intends to propose a form of, of radical reflexivity since he claims that his genetic ontology is the overcoming of the face-to-face -face relationship between subject and object. The object of this ontology is the process of individuation. And the knowledge of individuation is itself, he says, the individuation of knowledge. And the knowledge, yes, the individual, uh, I, I want to see uh, some remarks would like to share this his screen or share any files of Atlan. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm reading the I'm reading the, com the comment on the discussion. Yeah my text my text has been has been sent to to Yuk and uh, I Yuk if I don't know if you want to if you want to to make it public or not. Maybe I can show your. Right. I know, I know, I know. This this project of philosophical relativity is very difficult but i don't, oh, yes but, uh, yeah i'm 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 showing the uh, i'm showing the, uh, the your text uh, so you can uh, you can continue jean luc yes okay um uh just uh, one thing um the last part the last paragraph are not corrected there are some problem of translation in the last paragraph okay But it is clear, it is clear that this reflectivity does not consist in witnessing its own genesis. And since it is unfortunate, as Simon said, that the subject cannot attend its own genesis, then the knowledge of individuation that is individuated in knowledge is a reflectivity by default. Now, the global and radically anti-dogmatic anti system of philosophical relativity allows the construction of self-knowledge that does not consist in witnessing one's own genesis, and that is only translated into genetic ontology in a second step, thus solving both problems in one gesture. In what follows, I will present this new first problematics called philosophical semantics starting from other motivations linked to the current schismatic situation of Western philosophy and no longer, no longer to the internal criticism of Simonian thought. I will then indicate the reasons why Simonian's genetic ontology seems to me to offer the second and adequate ontological translation of these new first problematics, subject of course to some modification some modifications during its refundation, reconstruction by an encompassing secondarization. But before doing so, I need to make a, a very brief assessment of the state of Western philosophy today. There are some questions in the discussion. I think we have to go ahead. I think uh, we cannot. Yeah. Okay. I think you just have to continue. I think. Uh, yeah, I continue. Yeah. yeah. So please don't 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 be disturbed by the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. For a cent for a century, Western philosophy has been divided into two traditions that tend to ignore each other. The first, called continental, continental, has a long history. The second, known as analytic, has hardly existed for a century. Yet, despite their undeniable difference, those traditions share the property of providing, so to speak, as many philosophies are, as there are philosophers, except that analytical philosophers 
specialized in specific questions rather than proposing a worldview and can thus more easily organize themselves into relatively unite, united camps, each claiming a nism, extensionalism versus intentionalism, realism versus nominalism, etc. But the time has passed when this perpetual battlefield of philosophy could hope to be overcome, as Kant wanted, by highlighting the conditions of possibility and the limits of knowledge. Today, Western philosophy can only invent the reflexive unity of this self-singularization. Uh, it's difficult for me to, to use some, some English word. Singularization of this shared disagreement, shared disagreement, which has always characterized it. There will be no knowledge as such, but a simple self-knowledge that singularizes itself while offering the new terrain or ground for a dialogue that is not that of the deep, but that works to think the individuation of sense-making. Analytical philosophy certainly aims to establish a dialogue between thinkers in the name of common principles of argumentation. Such principles are also present in much of the continental tradition and the ability of analytic philosophers to engage in dialogue has more to do with an Anglo-Saxon academic cast of mind, not yet that of their Austrian precursors. Frege and Wittgenstein. It is by virtue of this cast of mind that the analytic field can collectively dialogue around a single recently published article held to be a decisive contribution. This practice is not unrelated to the idea that knowledge as such is possible in philosophy. If one is passionate and modest in one's aim, and if one's aim is itself analytical and not global. But there is an illusion here, as evidenced by the ephemeral and reversible character of the decisive, decisive contribution of this or that article. And this illusion was already Bergson's illusions, illusion, despite the radical difference between analysis and intuition. Such an illusion consists in aiming at a knowledge that would be obtained by increasing approximation which is already the case of the most exact natural science. Philosophy deludes itself about its vocation and its possibilities for lack of having been able to re reinvent itself after its failure in the path of apodicticity opened by Plato. Now, we will see that the way invented by philosophical relativity will consist in a return to the most originary watchword of philosophy, which unfortunately has never been a pri priority. This watchword is of course that of simple self-knowledge. The new modality of this self-knowledge in which the new first problematics offered but to philosophy by philosophical relativity consist, will also allow philosophy to assume once again its mission which that does not consist in locking itself up in this or that so-called local knowledge, but in covering different fields of problems, epistemo-ontological, political-economic, pedagogical, axiological. Starting from an attitude that is not an attitude of knowledge proper, a privilege of science. To understand this, we must get rid of a philosophical prejudice that is dominant today. The prejudice according to which a global system would necessarily be a system of knowledge instead of its globality being the very consequence of the abandonment of the claim to knowledge proper. Philosophical relativity will consist here in redefining the different fields of philosophy so that the globality of the philosophical system can become can become the most immediate consequence of such an abandonment of the claim to knowledge proper. 
There is, in fact, another way for philosophy than those of apodicticity and increasing approximation, both of which are ultimately character characteristic of the sciences, among which mathematical apodicticity constitutes not only the pure instruments for physics, but a science of relations and virtual operations. This third way I am talking about is that of now thyself, a self-knowledge. As it proceeds from a prior understanding of what is at its core and by difference, the growing approximation of knowledge proper that is offered by the science. This is why it is necessary to think of the conditions by which the knowing subject of the sciences differs fundamentally from the philosophizing individual. In order to come to what will make the still unthought of advantage of the sciences with respect to philosophy, it is necessary to pose the new philosophical problem with respect to which one can indeed speak of a still unthought of advantage of the sciences. If this problem is new, it is because the fundamental difference between philosophy and science will not be limited here to the question of objectivity. It concerns another advantage of, of the sciences, which has been ignored until now, because this advantage has the same conditions as scientific objectivity. This new philosophical problem, which I believe to be the most fundamental of all, because it engages the question of method in philosophy, is what I call the cardinal problem of dysentery. It resides in the fact that the attitude of knowledge, insofar as it places the knowing subject and the known object face to face, leads to the subject becoming originary without its knowledge, if it is not accompanied by a methodological, methodological dysentering of this subject. Indeed, once the object is made object, it seems that the sense making concealed by this object does not constitute the subject, which is thereby, thereby rendered, rendered implicitly originary. This problem is much more fundamental than that of so-called objectivity, which is a laborious conquest whose first and much broader condition is the objectivation of the manipulated meanings as they, as they claim to be equal to the things they designate. By the word meanings, I mean what philosophy since Kant has called representations, a term that served the attitude of knowledge that I want to denounce in philosophy. It is the objecti objectivation of manipulated meanings, therefore, that I want to, to interrogate, because it makes human consciousness itself an illusion, illusionary structure. Indeed, all human consciousness, in reality, in fact, is objectivizing for sense-making as soon as it affirms something about something. We understand here that the problem I have been posing since my thesis is that of human consciousness in general as a structure of erasure of its own finitude. For this objectivation of manipulated meanings implicitly makes the human subject a being that would not be constituted by the, meanings, the making sense of those, of those meanings. Thus, a being that would be originary with respect to sense making. Thus, even before the conquest of objectivity, the problem of the spontaneous objectivation of meanings by human consciousness as intentionality and structure of erasure of its own finitude arises. My questioning is here not only reflexive, but archi reflexive because it does not concern the human subject thought by the philosophizing subject, but it concerns the philosophizing individual himself or herself in his own relation, relation to the meanings he or she manipulates. This questioning is also radically anti-ecological. Husserl, 
spoke of a natural attitude of intentionality that forgets itself in its object. This attitude was defined by him as a forgetting by intentionality of its own meaning giving originality. On the contrary, I denounce a spontaneous and implicit erasure by intentionality of its own non originality. For the object in which it forgets itself is also spontaneously made object by virtue of the objectivation of the manipulated meanings, whose sense making is implicitly made non constitutive of the subject. Such is the structure of the erasure of finitude within human intentionality. Now, the sciences have this unthought of uh, this unthought of virtue, virtue that the very conditions of their objectivity are also the conditions by which much more fundamentally they can avoid implying the or originality of the subject implied by the by the objectivation of the meanings manipulated by, by this subject. We can take physical knowledge as a paradigm here, as a paradigm. This, in fact, prevents the, know the knowing subject from making itself originary without its knowledge, insofar as physics, a mathematical experimental science, bases its approach on an initial decentering of this knowing subject, which reconstructs itself as a subject by passing through, through the double mediation of mathematics and, and instruments. Here, it is no longer the psychic individual as such who objectivates the manipulated meaning and who implicitly posits himself as non-constituted by the sense-making of those meanings. The knowing subjects of physics objectivates the manipulated meanings only under the constraint of mathematical instrumental decentering. What about the philosophizing individual? He or she objectivates the meanings he or she mani manipulates as equal to their reference or denotation. But does he or she possess a mode of decentering that allows him or she to not to, be, to become originary without his or her knowledge in his or her activity as a subject who objectivates the manipulated meanings. The second Wittgenstein, that of the philosophical investigations, thought that the traditional philosophical language game led to hypostasis, and that this game had to be brought back to ordinary language. The last Wittgenstein in Uber Gewissheit questions the common attitude of ordinary language and the philosophical language game, and tries to define, in a way he admits to be confused, what would be the unfold. He takes examples that belong at least as much to ordinary language as to philosophical language, and that inspire me to extend his questioning in the following way. Any S is P proposition, consists in objectivating meanings in order to say what is real through them. As if sense making of those meanings was not was it, what is never there in front of, but is individuated in me, who is not originary. Traditional philosophy therefore only exacerbates an implicit self absolutization of the subject that is already present in the natural attitude itself. It is therefore all the more legitimate to say that the philosophizing individual in his or her practice of meanings and whatever the thesis he or she defends has so far made himself or herself originary without his or her knowing it as non-constituted by the sense making of the meanings he or she manipulates. Not possessing any means of disentering the philosophizing individual 
has neither the means of guaranteeing the objectivity of his or her discourse, nor the means of avoiding the self-absolutization implied by the objectivation of the manipulated meanings. I would add that it would be necessary to specify to what extent the decentering of the knowing subject is present in varying degrees and modalities in all the sciences. Each science has its own mode of decentering, which is appropriate to its specific object. Philosophy, on the other hand, is devoid of any mode of decentering. And for this reason, it is condemned to aim at something other than knowledge proper at the risk for the philosophizing individual of unknowingly rendering himself or herself originary in the absence of decentering. For the decentering that guarantees the objectivity of the sciences is also what protects the knowing subject from making himself implicitly originary at the moment of objectivation of the manipulated meanings. Such is the fundamental point from which the methodological decision proper to philosophical relativity as a fault of the individuation, the individuation of sense making proceeds. It will be a matter of multidimensional multi diffraction of any manipulated meaning, which is never reduced to the sole dimension of the object of knowledge that is nevertheless targeted through it. It will be a question in this of adopting a archi reflexive and radically anti-natural attitude. Western philosophy, not having ex explicitly posed the question of the relationship of the philosophizing individual to the meanings he or she manipulates, or having done so only according to the linguistic term of analytic philosophy, has not be, been able to distinguish itself from an enterprise of knowledge, knowledge proper. The linguistic term was intended to be a different way of taking a reflexive step back from phenomenology. It was a question of questioning the language in which the philosophical operation itself is expressed. But apart from the path opened up by the second Wittgenstein, the linguistic term claimed to be based on Frege's propositional logic known as the calculus of predicates. Such a logicist conception could only accentuate the illusion of philosophy as knowledge proper. And even with the second Wittgenstein and his heirs, philosophy has not been able to reconstruct itself in, a, in an archi-reflexive manner. That is to say, according to a systematicity that would be the very consequence of the abandonment of the claim to knowledge proper. We therefore need a new kind of, of reflexivity, paradoxical because radical which represents a semantic double reduction. Any meaning, any meaning thought through the common name has several dimensions in its sense-making. And the denoted object is only one of those dimensions. The double reduction consists in passing from the reality of the denoted object to the representation that denotes it. And then in passing from this representation, to the multidimensional meaning that encompasses this dimension of the object and gives it sense making. This is the, a double operation by which the philosophizing individual is no longer confronted with objectivated meanings reduced to the sole object dimension they contain, and henceforth thinks of sense making insofar as it is individuated within him or her. Western philosophy, whether continental, continental or analytic, far from constructing such a self-knowledge in its modesty, has persisted in wanting to know beyond the sciences. And this is why it has remained the battlefield denounced by Kant. The ultimate consequence of this blindness is that in the present era, the advances of cognitive science towards an, an, an understanding of the interpenetration 
of the dimensions of the being subject, emotion, cognition, action, are leading to the replacement of philosophy by science. Whereas philosophy should make it the motive for an awareness of its true role, the invention of a simple self-knowledge through the multidimensional diffraction of manipulated meanings, according to an archi-reflexive method that is symmetrical and complementary to the scientific objectivation of manipulated meanings. Thus, while science becomes capable in its objectivation of manipulated meanings of showing that emotion, knowledge, and action are dimensions of the being subject that are both ir irreducible to each other and constitutive of each other, philosophy, for its part, can invent the means of circumventing the spontaneous objectivation of manipulated meanings in order to render, to render the philosophizing individual capable of thinking of himself or herself as constituted by the multidimensional sense-making of any manipulated meaning. The identification of those different dimensions of sense-making that constitutes me then engages the, redefin the redefinition of the different domains of philosophy. Those domains can no longer be posited a priori, for they must henceforth, henceforth by, uh, be defined according to the dimensions of sense-making that will have been identified as constitutive of the philosophizing individual, because they are individuated within him or her in order to under, engender him or her as a finite or non-originary subject. The philosophical system, in the classical meaning of this term, articulated domains of inquiry, ontology, ethics, etc., without those domains arising from a multidimensional diffraction internal to any manipulated meaning. The meanings manipulated by the philosophizing individual were objectivated or reduced to their single dimension of object out of a concern to know something about, about something. The redef redefinition of the globality of the system as an immediate consequence of the abandonment of the claim to knowledge proper will therefore also be a redefinition of the domains of philosophy on the basis of the dimensions of sense-making brought out, out by the new problematics of archi-reflexive semantics as simple self-knowledge. Self this simple philosophical self-knowledge, which practices the, the multidimensional diffraction of manipulated meanings, is thus only the first and radically anti-dogmatic problematics of a global system composed of translations of these first problematics in each of the dimensions of sense-making that will have been released by, by it. Now, among these, those dimensions of sense-making, there is the epistemo-ontological dimension. And, in, and it is here that Simondonian genetic ontology largely prefigures what's, what will henceforth have to be thought of as the ontological translation of the first philosophical semantics. The Simondonian thought of individuation is the thought of the information process information being the formula of individuation. Now, as I showed in chapter five of La Société de l'Invention, in philosophical relativity, information is precisely one of the three most general, general dimensions of sense-making that are identified by the new semantic problematics. It is in fact the dimension of sense-making that has been privileged since Plato within a Western philosophical tradition aimed at knowledge proper. This dimension having, having in fact overshadowed the other two dimensions, which are nevertheless present in the sense making of any manipulated meaning. Those two other general dimensions of the sense making of any manipulated meaning are production, production for the satisfaction of needs and education as a, the transmission of values. Thus, for example, the meanings tree or table 
or human or freedom or concept make sense both as something that refers to an object of information, as something that satisfies certain needs, and as something that, that conveys certain values. The Simondonian thought of individuation, therefore, adequately translates the new first problematics into the ontological domain by elaborating a philosophy of information whose thought of individuation is ontogenetic in the sense of genesis. This thought accounts ontologically for the finitude or non-originality of the subject, which in philosophical relativity imposes precisely, precisely not to start with ontology, but with the simple semantic self-knowledge. The difference between the multidimensional sense-making and the single dimension of object has as its ontological translation, it is within this same dimension of object, the difference between object and substance. For Simondon, who did not have the, the archi-reflexive semantics, this ontologically principal difference took the form of the difference between individual and substance. Economic production, ontological information, and axiological education are the three most general dimensions of sense-making that the new first problematics proposed by philosophical relativity identifies. Insofar as many, any meaning manipulated by the philosophical individual can be diffracted three-dimensionally along those most general dimensions. I will not explain here how I identify the dimensions of sense-making individuated in me as the dimensions of economic production, ontological information, and axiological education. For this point, for this point see uh, La Société de l'Avention, chapter five. I will simply point out that it is de uh, decisive that the meanings that de 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 sorry, that designate those dimensions of sense-making are meanings that de designate mode of action. action. Indeed, the finitude or non-originality of which we must become, become aware and which is that of the philosophizing individual himself or herself possesses a structure of erasure by which we cannot avoid to objectivate the meanings we manipulate and thus to render ourselves implicitly originary. Now, meanings that de designate modes of action have the particularity that even when objectivated, they still de designate what of the object constitutes the subject, since they are mode of action. Thus, philosophical semantics, which is archi-reflexive, is the, few, is the new first philosophy aiming at a simple self-knowledge in which the philosophizing individual ceases to make himself implicitly originary because it allows to bypass the structure of erasure of finitude that is the il illusionary structure of human intentionality. This new first problematics of philosophy identifies the three general dimensions of the sense-making that makes me, and then translates this non-originality of the philosophizing individual in each of the dimensions of sense-making. In the dimension of ontological information, this translation produces a genetic ontology, which is a thought of the individuation process. And this is why Simondon's genetic ontology is a particularly relevant first version here. Now, genetic ontology, when it comes to the vital regime of individuation and the development of the psyche, the, the, the psyche within it, finds the three-dimensional structure of sense-making, but this time it finds it ontologically and no longer archi-reflexively, by positing that the, the animal is three-dimensional, action, perception, emotion. This three-dimensionality, now an ontological object, then leads by complexification to the three dimensions of economic production, 
ontological information and axiological education. When we, we move on, on to the, the ontological analysis of the trans-individual regime, of which Simondon posited a first theorization. Thus, ontogenetic thinking of individuation leads to an ontological account for the non-originality of the philosophical individual, which was initially thought of in the archi-reflexive mode defined by the new form of self-knowledge proper to philosophical semantics. Such is the secondarization by encompassing refundation of genetic ontology within the all encompassing but radically anti-dogmatic system of philosophical relativity, which will have to reconstruct genetic ontology under the name of ontological information philosophy, while adding to it an axiological philosophy of education and a philosophy of economic production. I would therefore like to conclude with some remarks concerning the modifications introduced by this reconstruction of genetic ontology. And those remarks will co also concern the status of technique in Simondon, but also in Stigler. First, Simondon, unlike André Leroy Gourand, did not think of the articulation of language and technique that made the, the genus homo possible. In the mode, uh, in, uh, on the mode of existence of technical objects, in, uh, in uh, 1958, Simondon does not propose a history of culture, but a genetic eidetics that constitutes a new phenomenology of mind. It thinks of the dimensions of culture as phases but distinguishes them from temporal moments and gives them the status of essences. It is within this framework, framework that he makes technique and religion into simultaneous, symmetrical and complementary phases, which will have arisen from the defacing of the primitive magical unity. However, this very specific approach, however, however um, I, I think that uh, the, the translation, the good translation is not however, but uh, now, now. This very specific approach prevents him from entering into what Le Gourand would inaugurate six years later, it is in 1964 the understanding of the fact that language is on the level of genesis, of a genesis, this time historical, a condition of the human being as fundamental as his, te his technique. Le Leroy Gourand spoke of language technique coordination, but today work in neuroscience encourages us to speak of a real interpenetration of language and technique that pre-existed humans, but in a separate state. What we call the articulated language of humans is also a language articulated with technology. And in, in such a way that language and technology form a real interface, producing the transformation of each of the two. In Homo, the language of the primates became grammaticalized language. It is technicized language, while the technology of the primates became a system of objects referring to each other, it is symbolized. Before coming to the consequences of this for, of this for a critical dialogue with Stigler, we can point out that the language technique interface allows us to account ontologically for the objective character of human intentionality. Uh, a precision here, it is not the objective character, but the objectivizing character of human intentionality for making sense or sense making. Here, what philosophical semantics denounced as a structure of erasure of the non-originality and not, not originality, non-originality of the subject 
can receive an explanation, but this one is ontological and thus both philosophically secondary and subject to the teaching of the sciences. This ontological, and in this case, ontogenetic explanation is as follow, as follows. The technologically reconstructed subject, that is homo, now possesses an objectivizing consciousness for the sense making that he and the other animals experience because in him language and technique have interpenetrated, interpenetrated. Language and technique now form an interface that is the double transcendence constitutive of his being. But this double transcendence paradox, paradox, paradoxically makes him capable of objectivating meanings as if the, lat as if the latter were not constitutive of, of him. Uh, I think here the notion of meaning should be replaced with the notion of sense making, sense making for, for each meaning we use. Such is the structure of erasure of non originality that characterizes human intentionality. To conclude my remarks today, I'd like to turn to the critical di dialogue I've been having for years with Bernard Stiegler's thought. One of Stiegler's greatest merits is to have, in his own way, diagnosed very early on the crisis of reflexivity that, I've been, that I have been talking about since La Société de l'Invention, and whose three forms I defined in a more pedag pedagogical way in Ego Alter, and then in my forthcoming manifesto for human ecology. In Stigler's terms, systemic stupidity has developed as a result of an industrial political economy that has transformed the essentially technical conditions of all human existence into something that destroys not only know-how and knowledge desire, but also knowledge thinking. Uh, I think it, it should be not knowledge, desire, uh, and knowledge thinking, but uh, uh, know, know how desire. I don't, I don't know how to, to translate this. Uh, know how, okay, for know how, know, uh, know, know, knowing desire. Knowing, thinking, I, I don't know. Uh, you could maybe you you you, you could uh, find a, a way to translate those notions because you know uh, yeah, Bernard, I think I, I, you know I, I, Bernard thought. I think you say know how uh, how how to desire how to think. Uh, yes. I think Ben often talk about savoir vivre, uh, how to live. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, savoir, so. savoir vivre. Yes, it's, it's okay for savoir vivre. Know how. It's uh, it's. Uh, I know that it's uh, the good translation. But the problem is for desire and uh, and uh, thinking. So uh, such is the generalized process of progressive proletari ah proletarianization. Yeah, oh la la, I don't, I, I, I'm not able to, to, to say it. Proletarianization, by virtue of which a pharmacology of the mind is required. Technique being pharmacon, both remedy and poison. But instead of proceed, proceeding to a critique of human desire, as the capitalist West has exacerbated in it, uh, it in the form of the desires of growth and consumption, Stigler has infinitized desire to make it what would mark the what would mark the nobility of human reason in in its break with animality. Two points need to be made here. First, the infinitization of human desire has nothing to do with the capacity of desire to change its object infinitely. Rather, it has to do with its capacity to aim at infinite or non-calculable objects, as Stigler's 
as Stigler put it. The idea of justice is the paradigm for him and the field of law embodies that which transcends mere facts. Now, this capacity of human desire becomes, becomes in Stigler the pretext to identify desire with reason itself via the idea of motives, which says both the motivation coming from desire and the reasons animating reason. Yet Stigler's critique of consumerism does assert that desire can desublimate. But at the same time, Stigler refuses to call desire what has become drive any longer, uh, pulsion, pulsion, what has become pulsion any longer, as if the essence of desire itself were to sublimate. This first point lead, leads us to the second, to the second. It is because the essence of desire uh, because the essence of desire would be to sublimate that Stigler makes desire the mark of the human without ever thinking of animal desire as it can develop beyond needs, the sphere of which, of which moreover, already exceeds simple vital, vital needs. In Stigler's work, there is a residual anthropological cut and this cut is also revealed in his thinking about technology, which makes, it, which makes it the condition, properly human, of desire itself. This is due to the very specific way in which Stigler transforms Le Roi Gourand's theory of the genesis of the human. Instead of rethinking the language technique coordination as a progressive interpenetration of a language and a, a technique that existed in a separate state in pre-humanity, Stigler absorbs language into technique. Indeed, for him, language itself becomes a form of technique, the latter being that paradoxical essence by which the human constructs itself, itself and has no essence or no nature. Here, Stigler, like his German contemporary Peter Sloterdijk, reaffirms and reformulates what was first affirmed and formulated by Sartre in an existentialist and not anthropotechnogenetic context. Of course, Stigler claims not to cut, to cut the human from the non-human animal, but this is why uh, this is why the anthropologi anthropological cut must be called residual rather than assumed. Um, I, I, I said but, and it is not but, it is and this is why. But its, it's residual uh, character does not prevent it from being real. And it is not enough to refuse the question itself as Stigler has erased down by brushing it aside in order to escape this cut that has marked our entire tradition of Western thought up to Heidegger, from which Stigler largely inherits by making the human a non-derivable who from the non-human animal. I think, I think, uh, it would be it, it would be better if I had a conclusion. But uh, concerning my reflection today, uh, I decided to to stop with those uh, remarks. I don't know. Uh, as a conclusion, I I would say that. The, the program and the project of uh, philosophical relativity, as you can understand it, uh, has for consequence that uh, the problematics of technology is itself a consequence of the ontological problematics, which is itself a consequence of the new semantic problematics because ontology becomes a translation, second, a second translation of the new first semantic problematics. As would be 
as would be uh, um, the, the, the axiological translation or the political translation. There are three translations of the new first and semantic problematics. And the ontological translation has consequences about the problematics of technology that, that is uh, the problem, problematics of your seminar, Yuk. Right, so th thank you very much, Jean Ruch, for this um, very complex but very exciting, interesting talk. So, um, 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 can, can you adjust your camera? Because I think we can only see half of your face. <laughs> Right now, it's better that we can see the whole face. So thank you very much. I think what well, I'm trying to, um, where sometimes we are very unconscious about uh, the technology. And uh, but um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, well, I'm going to have we are going to have a discussion. But I mainly wanted to clarify uh, some of the points that you 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 um, you have talked about. Uh, so I I just wanted to. Um, I would like to clarify these points, but also engage with some of the um, some some of the things that you have said. Now, um, but if if I understand correctly, your project you know, your your project is extremely ambitious in the sense that you wanted to resolve, you want to develop a, a new approach of philosophizing of a new new methodology of philosophy that also allows you to kind of overcome the uh, dichotomy between continental philosophy and um, analytic philosophy, a project that I think very, very ambitious and, uh, uh, and, and you all also develop a very fierce um, critique of analytic philosophy in your talk, uh, but also uh, that of the continental tradition since Plato on especially the theory of uh, knowledge. For myself, I tried to deal with this question uh, in my first book on the existence of technical object, where I also engaged with Heidegger, Stigler, Rousseau, and Dumet, um, uh, Poonam, Frege, Wittgenstein, Kripke, and so on. But I did it in a, in a very much more modest way. I tried to work on the question of, of, of digital object and use uh, digital object as um, as one example to articulate how this could be overcome. Uh, and later, I found also um, try to articulate maybe what you what you what you might call uh, ashy reflexivity in the continuation uh, of in in my 2019 book recursivity and contingency, which is um, a, 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 a treatise on on the question of reflection. Um, so I think we work on a quite similar paths. And uh, so your, your, your project is uh, of extreme, uh, is extremely interesting for me. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to clarify uh, two points, but also to help the uh, audience to understand. Now, at first point, I wonder, um, um, what would you, or how would you distinguish uh, or differences, what you call the sense making or sounds, uh, from what Hegel might call concept. Uh, because I think there is a also kind of ashy reflexivity in what Hegel called a concept brief, um, especially in what might be called the, the positive infinite judgment. That is uh, uh, where we can read that also into what Wittgenstein. Uh, in his book, uh, which you cited, uh, Uber Gewissheit, you know, where Wittgenstein firstly asked about, you know, uh, do I have a hand? You know, the question of the hand. But the fundamental question that was raised by Wittgenstein, uh, the late Wittgenstein, maybe we can say that summarized in this, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's number 520, uh, that he, he says that the doubt which doubted everything would not be a doubt. A doubt that doubted everything would not be a doubt. And, and I think this is a kind of, a, where maybe you can read it into the Hegelian, Hegelian 
positive uh, in final assessments and so on. So there is a reflexivity, maybe you can say in Hegel's uh, concept. Uh, so how will, you, how will you distinguish your notion of songs uh, from what Hegel uh, called the grief? Now, the second point I wanted to clarify, I, I also have some other points, but I will we we'll do it step by step. The second point I think that might it might be helpful to clarify is that your question, your 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 philosophy on sense making actually comes from your own concern on ecology, not only in an abstract sense, but also in a political sense. So sense making and ecology and your concern of the Anthropocene. That was already outlined in the introduction of uh, La Société de l'Invention. So I, I wonder, you know, in this second question, would you make a, 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 the link more explicit? Um, so these are the two questions that we can start with yeah. for some clarifications. Yeah, thank you, Yuk. Uh, I will, I will, uh, I will uh, answer to first to the second question. Um, the reason why I, I choose uh, the name of uh, ec ec human ecology for, for the globality of the system, the system has, has three, three names, philosophical relativity, system of individuation of sense-making, and human ecology. And the reason why human ecology is uh, can be can be uh, a good name for the system in its globality, and you are right here. I, I think uh, the the reason is that this ecology is if, is not is not uh, simply a political ecology. It's a project of a fundamental ecology, because the most fundamental crisis is not the ecological crisis or the ecological catastrophe. The most, uh, the most fundamental crisis is the crisis of sense-making itself. And the project of the semantics, of the archi-reflexive semantics, is the project of an ecology of sense-making. The, the, the way the way to to uh, think the way to think the cri the crisis of sense making is the dif diffraction of each meaning into the three general dimensions of the sense making and this this operation this archi reflexive operation is the ecology ecology of sense making itself And the, the, the political ecology will be a consequence of this, of this fundamental and archi-reflexive operation. Exactly as the, the ontological problem, problem, problematics is also a consequence. That's why poly, uh, human ecology designates the entire system and not, and not the, uh, only the political consequences. Um, one of the most important consequences is within the political problematics, the unification between political ecology, philosophy of right, and political economy. Political ecology will, will belong to the political translation of the philosophical semantics. Philosophy of right will also belong to, to this political, uh, political translation. And political economy will also belong to this political translation, because political ecology, philosophy of right, and political economy are the same problematics. 
here I have the ambition of a unification of the three. And we need such a, a unification because we need a political thought based on the problem of health. The problem of health is the problem of the satisfaction, satisfaction of suffering needs. And this problem of suffering needs is the problem of the foundation of the new foundation of right. Of what I call right is uh, the law. The new foundation of the law is the normativity of the suffering needs in a system based on the concept of health. Political ecology is fundamentally a, a, a problem of health. Political economy is a problem of health. And philosophy of right has to become a philosophy of the normativity of the suffering needs, among, among which the need for, for health is the central and autonormative need. This is the, 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 the main, the main uh, political consequence. It is the unification of political ecology, philosophy of rights, and, and, philosophy, and uh, political economy. And philosophy of rights is, in my opinion, the, uh, the, center, the center of political philosophy. So we have, we have a, a semantics, a first fundamental uh, and actually reflexive uh, semantics, semantic problematics, which is an ecology of sense making, because sense making, uh, sense -making uh, is, uh, is, uh, has uh, a crisis in our era. It is the fundamental crisis of our era. And then we have in the political translation, we have a, 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 a political ecology, which is unified with philosophy of right and uh, political economy. That's why the name human ecology seems to me to be a good name for the entire system. I come to the, the, first, the first question. question. If I understand what you, what you mean, the problem for you is the difference between the project of philosophical relativity and what Hegel proposed. Yes? Yeah, no, you, I, I, yes, I, you said, I said You said Hegel and Begriff, the, the Begriff in Hegel. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so I was thinking that maybe if, if, if they help if you can clarify how you know how how to uh, how to articulate the difference between what you want to propose as sounds and what what Hegel uh, called belief, but because I think in that yeah. uh, you know these are two these concerns uh, you know maybe two uh, uh, philosophical systems uh, all based on a kind of actual reflectivity. So I think it may be some clarification we yeah. have to understand better uh, your projects. It's a it's a very good question because uh, I didn't I didn't. Um, I don't know, I didn't say it in uh, La Société de l'Invention, but um, for uh, 30 years, for 30 years, when I, I began to, to have a few intuitions for the philosophical relativity, uh, I, I, I had the idea that Hegel is, the radical and supreme adversary for philosophical relativity. I, I think that I, I, I need uh, a critical dialogue with Hegel because finally, the project of philosophical relativity will have a, a, a common gesture with the project of Zeinunzeit. You know that for Heidegger, Hegel was the, 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 the supreme adversary. And uh, I, I published a, a paper on, 
Heidegger's confrontation with Hegel, because I think that Heidegger fails. Heidegger fails in this confrontation with Hegel. And my project, my project is to not fail, <laughs> to not fail in this confrontation, because it, I, I can explain. I can explain a, a, a point that um, I, I didn't explain in my talk, because in my talk I, I spoke uh, I, I spoke uh, uh, um, about uh, Wittgenstein, but not uh, about Heidegger. And Heidegger is very important for me. In Zeitung in the paragraph um, the paragraph 13, 13 of Zeitung Zeit, Heidegger said, "All right, that knowledge." is only one mode within a multi-modal uh, being in the world. Knowledge is only one mode in the multi-modal being in the world. Personally, I, I, I have replaced the notion of being in the world by the notion of sense-making, a multi-dimensional sense-making. And my my just my just my philosophical gesture consists to to apply to the philosophizing individual what Heidegger said about the relation between the design and the being in the world. I want to apply it to the philosophizing individual itself, and I reproach I reproach Heidegger to absolutize absolutize uh, himself at the moment he affirms the finitude of the design. And that's why I think that he, 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 fails, he fails in the confrontation with Hegel. The philosophical relativity must become the symmetric, the symmetric operation, the symmetric system uh, in regard uh, uh, with, uh, with regard to uh, uh, Eagle system. Right. It's, so it, I, I recognize that there is in Eagle uh, an archi reflexivity, but this archi -reflex reflexivity is an archi reflexivity for the, the absolute knowledge. And that's why a conf confrontation is uh, is needed here and it is a very good question <laughs> right so thank, thank you very much uh Jean -Luc. i think it is also leads to 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 the to the uh, to my second um point uh i mean if uh, if there is such a similarity between your thought and uh, your system and, and it, as you said a symmetry to hegel's system so in what sense is your project not an idealist project, <laughs> for example? And this approach course leads us to the question, to the confrontation between idea or uh, kind of idealism and, and technique. Uh, I, I'm sure that I, I, I'm convinced that you are not uh, in that direction, but I think uh, a confrontation is necessary. Uh, and this leads to, to our, maybe to, to what you said about Bernard and, um, about Stigler's work. Uh, and I think maybe here we can also take Stigler as an entry point to, to articulate uh, again, you know, this relation between uh, idea and techniques. And, um, you know, Bernard is now in the heaven, so I can only speak uh, in, in his name. Uh, regarding your critique of Bernard, I think in that, uh, the issue itself is rather complicated, and we should start firstly with Bernard's critique of André de Vagoron in the first volume of uh, Latin Eleton, where Bernard reproaches uh, um, Le Vagoron, who says that um, in the Homo sapien, or with the Homo sapien, there was a rupture. This rupture was a uh, 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 presented or represented by the fact that the Homo sapien was found to be um, capable of producing, let's say, art and literature, let's say, writings. 
and uh, uh, Gestalt. Uh, and the, the critique of Stigler is that this, this distinction or this rupture that was presented by Le Vagoron in, uh, in, in speech and gesture um, didn't see the continuity or the persistence of techniques uh, from, for example, the 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 uh, the, the prehuman, uh, the 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 prehuman, um, the other humanoid, and uh, and 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 the Homo sapien. Uh, now we can understand why she says this is because uh, because a particular reading of Derrida, that Derrida already uh, says in the Dragomatology. Um, and that continues in, in Stigler, uh, so, uh, critique of André Le Vagoron. And because we know that Le Vagoron did make a very clear distinction between the mouth, let's say, let's say the face, and the hand. Um, and that somewhat leads to also his, his, his uh, a theorization of the Homo sapien, and that they're not want to deconstruct. Uh, um, that's clear. So I can understand why you said Stigla has absorbed language in techniques, in that sense, because of his critique of uh, Le uh, theorization of the rupture between Homo sapiens and uh, the Neanderthal and, uh, and, 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 and earlier humanoid. Um, the, the, the human apes. So, um, but at the same time, uh, I think that this is a very much grounded on his interpretation of the relation, the intimacy between writing and speech that was already prefigured uh, in Derrida's writing. Uh, so the animality that you said and the human being but actually, I think from this critique of stigma, the difference is actually even minimal than what you would reproach him. Yeah? And in his, if I, if I remember correctly, and I understand him correctly, that actually between the animality and for him, there is basically no human. Uh, human is a technical being, and all animals also have the potential uh, to, 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 to become maybe what we call a human, if, if they are able to employ, develop such, a, 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 um, um, uh, to, to develop the, the, uh, the, the, sim the, the symbols in such abundance as the human beings. Um, and then that's take us to the second point about desire. Um, again, I think the desire, but I'm not sure if desire could be identified with reason uh, for sticking that because I think desire is understood as an investment, not exactly reason. And this investment, which is contrast with drive, uh, with pursuit, with drive. Drive leads to um, addition. But desire for him, he, he did give a positive meaning to design as a kind of investment. And this investment is also, we can also find this investment in animal. So I would not say there is no animal desire per se. So the example would be the investments of the animal's love, for example, in the children for, uh, that we can also observe um, in, our, in, our, in our everyday life. Uh, I mean, if, if domesticated animals or wild animals, there is also the desire, as a kind of desire at play, uh, which is more like investments or affilia instead of reason. Um, so that would my, be my defense of, of, of Dana, you know, after my you know, questioning about the, 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 the 
opposition between idealism and materialism or idea and techniques and, and my defense of Bernard, I would say that these, um, uh, what he says about animal and uh, human being may be not as sharp as you were trying to point out. Yeah, I will begin one more time with the second point. Uh, in the Pharmacologie du Front National, as you know, there is a, a very important uh, paragraph that I quoted in uh, one or two of my texts. And this paragraph in Bernard said that the idealization due to the, to the desire is the matrix, the matrix of all ideations of knowledge. And this is the point. This is the point why I, I say that desire and reason are the same thing in Bernard. There is no reason without desire and desire is fundamentally human, a human phenomenon. Because desire is the condition of the infinitude of the, ide the idealities. And this is the problem in, for me because there is animal desire and desire is not infinite. Desire is not a, an infinite reality. This is my problem in the, in the dialogue with Bernard. And I, I am, I am a, a philosopher, not of desire, but of uh, willing. What, will, what we need today is willing against a, against a society of desire. Because willing is what, we, is what can uh, render us uh, uh, able to fight our own desire. And we need to fight our own desire. And pulsions are desire. There is, there is a contradiction in, the, in Bernard's text. Because in one way, Bernard said that desire can, can desublimate into pulsion. And in another, in another way, Bernard refuses to, to call desire what, is, what has become what has become pulsion. It was one, one, uh, uh, one point uh, in, uh, in uh, one very central po point in uh, my, my disagreement with Bernard and, with, uh, and, and even in the rupture, in the rupture of uh, our friendship. Because this day, this day, when I said to him that if desire can disciplinate into pulsion, we must admit that pulsion is still a form of desire. He answered, answered to me by, and by crying. He answered to me, not, no, this pulsion is no more desire. This is a, a, very, a very problematic point for me. And I, I think that Bernard, like Derrida, is a philosopher of the A transcendental. And this A transcendental is a new form of the transcendental itself. And that's why desire in Bernard is infinite. Infinite and the ground for reason, for the ideations in Husserl the problematics in Husserl, the problematics of the ideations, and Bernard introduced desire as a, the condition of those ideations in knowledge. Thank you, thank you, uh, jean -Luc. I think I, I, I think what you point out, uh, that this, the, well, maybe say the dichotomy between desire 
and uh, Jive, what you call Fusio uh, Jive. I think this is normally translated into Jive. So the, the, the antinomy, the, the, sorry, not antinomy, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the opposition between desire on the one hand and Jive on the other hand in Stigger, I think we, sh we can discuss, continue to discuss this question because I don't think it is so clear it's so clear when we think of what he said, you know, the, 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 par the paragraph that you have cited, um, ideal, idealization uh, due to the desire of, or also the, uh, the question of idealization, because I think what, of course, when we talk about, yeah, actually, I, tr I, I tried to, I wrote about this in the article that I will send to you for, for this special issue that you are editing, uh, uh, for philosophy today, that I try to articulate uh, where where uh, Bernard's concept of desire is from. Uh, for me, less from Lacan, less uh, or maybe some part from Freud, but I think mostly from Plato. <laughs> that because uh, the, the, the desire is always uh, for him is the desire, but, uh, or maybe say eros is about the object of desire rather than desire itself, but and the object of desire can only be idealized because it does not exist as such. Therefore, the idealization presupposes techniques in its, uh, um, as it's a possibility. And idealization in that sense maybe we can say that it grounds uh, uh, reason, but it's not identical with reason. I suspect that there is such an identity between desire and uh, reason, but rather the object of desire, the object of desire, because it does not exist, and it can only be idealized through uh, te technical means, that is to say, for example, drawing or writing, and for, in that sense, it grounds reason, but not design is reason. It's just what, how I understand. Um, even though I, I think that uh, should, uh, the opposition between desire on the one hand and jive, uh, where maybe uh, uh, if we can say that there is such an opposition between Bernard, uh, you know, in Bernard thinking, then we can also ask what might be the criteria to that device or demarcates uh, design and drive. And actually this question I already, I also raised to him many years ago, um, but I don't think that there was such a clear answer to that. So at some point in some, you know, I partly I agree with what you says about the distinction between drive and, 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 and design. On the other hand, I think that, uh, um, probably is not as clear as in him, you know, in he, maybe probably in he, his, his thought is um, there is a, a, a complexity that could not be reduced to such opposition as well. Um, um, that would be my, that would be my, my, my response to that, but also that precisely his, his idea of thinking about technique as uh, ways of idealization um, um, of the object of desire, probably something that can be quite useful for you, uh, for, for, your, for your system of, of sense making as well. That's my, my uh, um, I don't know if you have uh, uh, any uh, remark on that. Uh, if no, then I can. I, I just would. Uh... Before, before uh, answering to uh, the questions I see in the dis discussion, I, I just uh, wanted to add that, that um, um, my project, uh, and uh, there will be a, a ped pedagogical uh, exposition, explanation uh, of this project in the, in the manifesto of uh, human ecology. Uh, this project um, uh, this project is in the political uh, problematics. Um, it is a project of uh, a fight against what I call society of desire and willing 
is what make us able to fight our own desires and willing will make us able to recognize the normativity of the needs against the logic of the society of desire, which ignore the normativity of, of the needs, of the suffering needs. The political, the unification of, uh, between political ecology, political economy and philosophy of rights will propose to refound the law, to refound the law on the basis of the normativity of the suffering needs. And the law will become the system of the, the compatibility the the, the the uh yes the compatibility between all the suffering needs of all species of all species that's why i want to to uh to refund law in order to uh to suppress for example to suppress um in this industrial industrial uh breeding for example to suppress industrial breeding because it is a system of uh, it is a system of um, um, it is a um, a system of of, of uh, uh, oblivion of oblivion of the of the normativity of the suffering needs in animals. So I I repress I repress. Bernard's desire with willing. And willing is what, what will be central to fight what I call desire. Because desire today is a desire of consumption. And what Bernard called pulsion is for me Sim simply for me, a, a, a desire that has become uh, a, a desire of consumption uh, due to the, the, the problematic uh, of the, the capitalism uh, and uh, the, 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 beco the becoming uh, uh, um, con uh, consumerist. Uh, the, the, the consumerist becoming of capitalism and uh, the problem of, uh, of uh, neoliberal, neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is uh, the, political, the political system uh, uh, that uh, uh, allows uh, consumerism, consumerism to, uh, to become uh, the, the new form of capitalist economy. And, I, I, I make the, the link with the question that I see uh, on, the, on the screen. I, I, I agree. I agree with uh, Bernard's criticism of uh, Foucault. I agree with that. But uh, um, I, 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 I think that the way, the way in Bernard to refound law is a transcendental way. This is my this is my problem with with Bernard Fort. Uh, in the, uh, it was in the uh, La Société Automatique. In La Société Automatique, Bernard uh, write, writes that uh, um, he writes that uh, there are uh, omnitemporal structures, omnitemporal structures, and. In my opinion, Bernard unifies all the domains, all the fields of philosophy into or through those omnitemporal structures. My, my way to, to unify, my way to unify all philosophical fields is the, the, the fundamental diffractions the fundamental diffraction into any manipulated meaning. It, it, there, it is a problem of method. 
it is a problem of method. For me, Bernard is still in a, a pretension of a knowing of philosophy as, as knowledge. It is my fundamental problem concerning the method. I am not in the knowledge. I am only in, the, in my self-knowledge as non-originary and constituted by the, the sense-making of the, the, of the meanings I, I, am, I am manipulating. And, and the consequence of, the, of, those, of this problem, of this fundamental problem of methodology, the consequence uh, concerns concern all the fields of philosophy. But we are in the same fight. We are in the same fight against uh, a society of consumption. Yeah, obviously. Thank, thank you, thank you, Jean Gust. I think that is why I also think that you know the the, the I saw the the the, the, the in, intimacy between sense making and 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 the belief and the way. But I I just um, you know but when when you say it view or, or viewing you know that. Even though you replace the word desire with will, then there is a still, you know, the, the 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 distinction, you know, like what Hegel was trying to say in the elements of philosophy of rights, that the distinction uh, starting with, with will, you have, we have on the one hand what he called the virtue, arbitrary, and on the other hand the freedom. You know, then there's a, another opposition is opened up by the concept of will. But I think maybe we should give uh, time to the questions that are raised. I don't know if you can see the Q and A uh, on at the bottom. Uh, there is a question from uh, Paul, uh, and Paul, uh, hi Paul. I'm happy that you are here. So, how do you understand the reduction of the secondary qualities by Galileo and his successors? Isn't this a unilateral reduction of an originality of the subject? I didn't understand you. Please you, repeat. Please repeat the. Can you can you read if you if you if you see at the bottom there is a Q and A. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. Yes. And you press okay, the Q okay. and A. You see two. How questions. do you understand? Yes. Okay. The reduction of the secondary qualities. By Galileo, and uh, isn't this a unilateral reduction of an I don't see the link between the problem of the secondary qualities and the problem that I raise of the originality of the, uh, of the non original originality of the subject. I I don't see I don't see the link. My problem is a problem, an archi reflexive problem. I, I am questioning the status of the philosophizing individual. It is absolutely not a problem, an ontological problem, and a problem of uh, no, uh, scientific knowledge through the reduction to uh, the, uh, the reduction uh, of the secondary qualities. There is no link. So I don't know if uh, if uh, Paul would like to uh, uh, let 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 uh, Paul would you like to follow up? I, I allow you to speak, Paul. If you if you would like to. Um... Yes. Um, right. Well, um, I I thought that that would be some kind of um, reduction of 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 the originality of the subject, which was the whole issue of the. Uh, of the working out of, uh, of the scientific method. And since you um, take uh, some credit uh, in this method, I was just wondering um, what you, what, uh, you would uh, think of this, these older um, reflections which circled around the reduction of of the subjectivity in in these uh, scientific experiments, of course, it's it's an ontological problem. It's not an archi reflective uh, problem, 
but uh, I just wondered uh, if that would not be uh, changing somehow your perception of uh, the uh, for the older philosophy uh, against which you want to to elaborate your uh, party reflexivity. Uh, Paul, uh, the, the problem for me is not a problem of, uh, you, you're right, you're right, reduction of an originality of the subject. Uh, what I denounce is the implicit originality of the the philosophizing subject. This is mm -hmm. what I denounce. And my archi-reflexive questioning is in this way, an opposition to all philosophies since Plato, since Plato and, uh, and uh, until uh, Bernard. I am questioning the implicit absolutization implicit absolutization of all philosophers. But it's true that you can perhaps uh, um, suppose or suppute uh, uh, an implicit uh, uh, position of the subject. And that was of course exploited by Descartes um, in relation to, to Galileo. But um, in fact, if you read Galileo, he is just uh, saying um, that, that you should not have uh, any subjectivity coming into uh, these um, scientific experiments. What I call, yeah, what I call dissentering, what I call dissentering is the, inter the inter intervention of mediation in the scientific work. And in, the problem is that I am distinguishing two, two problems. There is a problem of objectivity and the conditions of objectivity. And the, problem, the difficulty is that the, those conditions of objectivity in science are also the conditions to avoid the self-absolutization of the subject. But the problem are not the same problem. The conditions are the same, but the problem are not the same. The decentering of the scientific uh, subject is the condition for objectivity. And it is also the condition to avoid the self-absolutization of the subject. But the, prob the two problems are absolutely different. The conditions are the same, but the problem are absolutely different. Because no, the, I second can understand. Problem, the, problem, the second problem is archi reflexive. It is not a problem of objectivity. But the, problem, the problem of absolutization of the, of the subject is absolutely not a problem of, object, of ob objectivity. The conditions, the conditions are the same, but the, 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 the problem uh, are two, two different problems. Mm, thank Sci you. <laughs> science science, science uh, has a double advantage. The first advantage is that through the mediations, for example, in physics, the mediation is mathematical instrumental, but in other science, uh, the, the mediations are uh, different because the, the mode the mode of decentering is different different in each science and this this uh, decentering in in all modes this decentering is the condition for objectivity but it also allows the subject to objectivizing the meanings that are manipulating, manipulated. And this objectivation of the meanings, of the manipulated meanings, is not, is not yet, is not yet what, uh, what uh, can uh, obtain, what, what can made, make us uh, able to obtain the objectivity. 
the objectivation of the meanings we are manipulating is a natural attitude of all human consciousness. Human intentionality is objectivizing for sense making. And it is a structure of erasure of the finitude. All assertion, all assertion of something about something is a problem for me. And science can assert something about something without absolutizing the subject. Because science has, each science has a mode of disentering through which the subject will reconstruct itself. And it well, is not, it is not the psychic individual which ob objectivize. Yeah. So, if, if I may interrupt you, <laughs> sorry. So, I, oh. yeah. <laughs> I, well, I just, just one remark. If you, um, uh, if you may, um, if I may, sorry. Um, uh, in fact, uh, um, this is what you uh, indicated when you said the analytical philosophy uh, um, went wrong um, in, a, in a certain sense when she, when she um, transformed the um, scientific method in, in so to speak, uh, an idealism or, a, well, a, 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 a sort of, uh, how, how would you, uh, well, then perhaps you can answer better, <laughs> sorry. Right, right, thank, thank you, Paul. I think I understand what uh, Jean was uh, saying, and I see also the, the, the great influence of uh, Wittgenstein's Ruber uh, Gewissheit behind uh, this question. So because of the time problem, I think maybe, I don't know if Jean Wu, if you wanted to answer the last question that was raised in the uh, Q&A uh, by, by, by- Yes, about Simon Don uh, yeah, and yeah. Kant. That's the right. theory of knowledge in the the proposition of the purposiveness from Kant. The principle of natural purposiveness. In French, you 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 would you in French you you would uh, translate this proposition this proposition. I th I think it's a uh, la fin de la nature. Uh, Okay, oh, yes. Opposite. yes, okay, yeah, yeah. The final is the problem of the finality. Finality about the fi finality, uh, uh, la fin, like a uh, destination, like, uh, um, okay, no, uh, uh, there is, there is no, there is no, uh, uh heritage, there is no heritage, uh uh from Kant here on this point i, I think what she, maybe what he or she was saying is uh he's uh, talking about life like, yeah, like yes la finalité yes. sans fin uh, you know the, the kind of yeah. purpose if not without purpose and that uh, because we cannot know the uh, finalité de la nature so there is a certain kind of also kind of uh, reflexivity there in in, in, but, in the reflective judgment it it is. It is not. It is not Simondon's theory of knowledge. Uh, it is. It is not in Simondon's theory of knowledge. The the link we can we can do is uh, between uh, Simondon's uh, thinking of uh, vital beings and the problem of internal finality in Kant, because. Simondon, Simondon is not vitalist, but he fights mechanicism. And in this way, there is a, a possible link between Simondon's think, thought of uh, vital beings and the problem of uh, internal finality in Kant. Yes. But not, uh, not in the, the sphere of aesthetic judgment. No. 
and, may, and, may. And, and not and not in the in Simonon theory of knowledge. It is not a problem of theory of knowledge in Simonon. I think maybe you know one 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 link could make is uh, it, it's it's a via it's mediated by via mediated by cybernetics. When when Simon Don in the uh, um, in the article uh, epistemology is cybernetic, where he says that it's only in the third critique that Kant was able to deal with cybernetics. <laughs> Um, and, 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 and that cybernetics may be something which can mediate between Simon Don's theory of knowledge and Kant's uh, uh, critique of judgment, uh, especially teleology. Uh, but that has to be reconstructed. I don't know, but I think Jean Louis probably has more insight into that. Simon Don, the theory if, of, of knowledge in Simon Don. Is, is not a, a, a central part of his thought. Uh, there are not many pages on the problem. Strict, strictly speaking, there are not many pages, many pages uh, uh, on uh, the, the problem of the theory of knowledge. What is sure is that his theory of knowledge, if we can speak uh, in, this, in this way, uh, is is not Kantian. It is sure. Uh, right. So I, I I I just want to add one point to that because I think you, if 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 there is a similarity we can draw. I mean I think you are completely right. Simon Don didn't say too much about knowledge, but I think what was significant. Uh, he says what knowledge is what you have quoted in your talk. Uh, La connaissance de l'individualisation et l'individualisation de la connaissance. Um, yes, but it is not a problem of theory of knowledge. What uh, you say, what you say here, is not a problem of, philo philo of, of theory of knowledge. It is a problem of philosophical re re reflexivity uh, in, yeah. in, in in its difference with science. Yeah, exactly. So it's not aiming for that knowledge, but I would say that maybe there is a similarity. In, in, in the sense of operation, in the mode of operation, but not in, uh, properly speaking, a, 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 a theory of knowledge. Uh, so, um, right. So um, there is, a, I, don't, I don't see there is any questions. And uh, so I wanted to thank uh, Jean Grouch very much for the, uh, Gen for his generosity of sharing with us his new thought uh, and his thought to go beyond Simon Don. Uh, at the same time, I feel that the, uh, we, we didn't really finish our discussion. And I really hope that will be another occasion that we have a more even more time to discuss uh, about your work and Hegel and uh, Stigler again. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think that that would be with, really with great pleasure. Yeah, would be really uh, fruitful for for all of us. So um, I want to thank you again for 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 this, and uh, I also want to thank the uh, participants for being here with us today. Um, and I also wanted to make an um, make an uh, advertisement that on the seventh of December there will be the fourth seminar with uh, Susanna Limbeck, and it will be on uh, the philosophy of music in Bernard Stigler, uh, where uh, Susanna went to research on uh, Stigler's um, um, work during his uh, during uh, during the, the the period when he was uh, director of IECA, so uh, it will be on the seventh of December. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks to everyone, and uh, thank you, especially Jean Rouge. <laughs>